So, what was the question again? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Well, they're they're less questions cut. and more. I'm just like, I'm just, well, I'm, I'm trying to use that once. This, this, is, this, is a, this is a therapy session for me, essentially. Thank you. You have got to work at that. I have got, yeah. Don't put your foot up, though. I've been, I've been, t I've been told off once. I'm allowed to do that, but I'm not allowed to raise my soul. That's correct, isn't it? I believe so. That is correct. Hello, and welcome to List's new podcast, The Guest. Uh, each of these episodes features a different guest in conversation with someone that really knows them, which is nice. Uh, we're recording this episode after a lovely dinner uh, with all of our mates, and they've now all hung around, most of them, uh, to hear what we've got to say, which is also very nice of them. To introduce myself, um, I'm Sam Diss. I'm a writer and editor from London. And for the past decade, I've been writing about menswear, football mostly, various lifestyle stuff, for lots of different publications. And until the summer, I was head of content for Mundial, which was a football lifestyle publication. And since then, I've been freelance. I've been a freelance creative consultant. So if anyone has any jobs out there, please do get in touch. Um, I first met Matt probably about six or seven years ago now when I was working on a different project. And I was just really trying to look for good menswear writers, really, of which at the time it felt like there weren't very many. And Matt's blog, Buckets and Spades, felt like something which was unpretentious and accessible and impeccably curated, which is a vibe that he has continued since then. Uh, and it's actually quite a hard balance to strike, which is something that really made me gravitate towards him. And we've stayed mates through Instagram since then, realizing that we had a shared connection over independent wrestling and uh, massively overpriced gray sweatshirts. <laughs> it's a real bond. Um, so yeah, welcome to the guest podcast, Matt Buckets. People can clap. No prompt either. No prompt. Yeah. I mean, I did say people can clap, oh. which I feel undermines the point slightly. Um, this is supposed to be a natural chat. You know, like yeah. we're just we're just two mates with loads of people. A couple watching of dudes. Us. A couple of dudes. Well, I'd just like to say that was very nice of you. Was Thank it good? you very much. Yeah, that was. I feel like I've done better was, intros. Oh, okay. Uh, take take two. Fine. Yeah. Can we do it again? Hello. Um, so I guess I'll start off with a proper question to start with. Um, so Matt, hello. Why are you like this? <laughs> <sighs> like, there's a question. How do you describe what you do? Because we were chatting a little bit earlier. How it's quite hard mm -hmm. sometimes to really mm -hmm. pinpoint to. I call them normies. Yeah. But just to just to everyday people, it's like so. Like, what do you do, Matt? Yeah. How do you answer that question? It becomes harder and harder every year. Well, according to my mortgage, I'm a journalist. Yeah. Because that was the only thing they understood at the time. It's like, we went through everything that I did at the time. So I talked about digital media, photography, fashion-based stuff. They were like, that's not going to fly when you want your mortgage at the time, like five years ago. So they said, what, what else do you do? Do you write? Yeah, that's the one. That'll You're a writer. It. We've got that. We've got that on our drop-down menu. And that was it. Has it got... Has that, has that, how do you feel about that label? Because is it, is it a bit weird? Because like, I still think about you as a menswear writer, even if... All, 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 I mean, we'll get into this, but like you definitely sort of like moved out much more into sort of like a lifestyle yeah. sector, really, and travel and all that sort of stuff. We'll get into that, don't we? Um, when you when like when you hear that you're a journalist, even if it's just on your mortgage, does it feel like you're like that doesn't even begin to like scratch the surface of what I do? Well, I mean, at the time I was excited that was that was going to be an accept. So I was like, yes, I'm a journalist. Yeah, call even me whatever though, you want. Yeah, me to totally. And I was at the time. Well, previously I'd worked at a couple of fashion magazines and such, so it made sense to my mum. I'd take pictures and put them on the internet, yeah. and the, that's as that's as good enough that it's going to get. Really, I mean, my mum's just got Instagram uh, about three months ago, and um, I went round, showed her how to use it. it took ages. Um, didn't hear anything about it for a couple of months, and then she said, "Oh, I saw it. I saw you doing some pictures in the park the other day, and it really threw me." Because I, I didn't know she was looking at stories. Mm. But she, she's seen my work now for the first time ever, pretty much. Do you now start to go, my mum's going to see that? Um, I'm not bothered. She's all right. <laughs> she's, she's all right? She's all right. She's, she, yeah. How's her, uh, her online curation? 
Uh, the old anonymous profile picture, zero friends. <laughs> one, she follows one person. Yeah, I mean, not too, not not both of the account, not also best of packaging as well. I don't know if she knows about that. But really, you're keeping, you're keeping that, that one elite. Yeah, I don't know if I oh, that's mentioned fair. it. Um, you mentioned about fashion magazines and stuff like that, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but try me. We, yeah, you will. <laughs> no, with, I mean. When you think about people that work at fashion magazines, they don't often have an accent like yours. Okay. Do you know what I mean? I mean, unless I'm unless I'm wrong, and there's a big black pool fashion zine scene. Uh, there's a few. There's a few. No, there's not. You'd be surprised. There isn't. How did you get into working in that? Um, what into magazines and such? Yeah. That was totally through uni. So I studied uh, fashion promotion and creative marketing at UConn, Preston, just next to Blackpool. Lovely uni, and we had a. Um, a year, which we can work in industry, find a job and work in industry. And I started working in Manchester at an events company. And then we had to fill out a year's worth. We had to do 12 months of um, pretty much of work experience. And then I applied for a job in London, a fashion magazine, and I got the job. So that was it. And I remember I, my first article that I wrote was about, there was some big trousers going around at the time. And I thought, right, big trousers. So what do we do there? Where does that come from? And I wrote about Charlie Chaplin. Great. And I, I tried to find a link between an old style and a, what was going on at the time. And um, how did I feel about working out of an accent? I've, I've never thought about it. Because it's, it's interesting. Never come up. It's the interesting though, one, isn't it? Because it's like, when you think <clears> of <throat> the kind of people that work in fashion as well, you think that there is maybe like a bit of a class divide yeah. as well. So it's an interesting dynamic that that adds into it, and that's not—is that not? I definitely something? felt overwhelmed at certain points. You know, not really being in the know, maybe, or like just feeling totally like I wasn't meant to be there. But everyone's felt like that at some point. Haven't oh they? yeah, now <laughs> essentially. So I never really, never really thought about it. That's honestly. good. Yeah. I'm not sure why that is. Should I have thought about it? I, I don't, you know what? I'm glad that you haven't had to think about it. That's probably a good thing. Yeah. I think, um, so, I mean, even like, like going back to when you were at college and, mm. and at uni and stuff like that, is this something that you always saw this sort of trajectory? <clears throat> I, I, I mean, like, how long ago are we talking about now without giving away your age? Obviously, we want to keep it. 2010, I was living in London, I think it was. I mean, were you even thinking about what your trajectory was going to look like from there? Were you like, right, cool, here is what I want to do. I want to be mm. cool guy on Instagram. Well, it wasn't even, was it, it wasn't even around then, was it? I, really, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, when people, like, I, I was doing a talk at a university last week, and one, one of the girls asked me, um, do you have a plan? And where do you see yourself in five years? And I've never had a plan at any point in my life, really. I've never thought, well, in five years, I'm going to be working for this guy or doing that. I'm more reactive than I always have been. And then she said, what are you going to be doing Like coming up? I've got no idea, just, just making it work. Yeah. And that's the way I've always been. I think that kind of planning, or lack thereof, kind of like works for when you are working on the internet. And people are like, I mean, there, there is no trend forecasting. There is no, of, of these like traditional ways of like planning forward. It's like, what works now? The algorithm might go, nah, actually don't like that anymore. And then you have to just move on to something else. I think that even from following you for the last few years, it felt like something where you were, when there was something that was happening, if you felt, it felt very natural for you to just run with it. Yeah. And I guess that that's probably led into that. This, this, I mean, it's the same with when I started sharing more about um, our house. We bought, we bought a house five years ago and then started documenting DIY stuff. And that totally opened a different conversation with different people that I was never expecting yeah. to which leads to more conversations six months on about other stuff that, that those guys are interested in that I you know, have no idea. For instance, wrestling, that's a good one. So I'm, I'm glad you I'm, brought it up. Thank you. I'm talking DIY, I'm talking putting up gutter in. Suddenly there's a wrestler that like, there's this ex-wrestler that's from Preston that always talks to me on my DIY stories. There's a link there to wrestling. I'm like, Let's chat about wrestling. Yeah, getting round to the. You're like, are you any good at DIY? <laughs> exactly, he's got a muscle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Um, in that change, I mean, so you've been freelance, what, five years now? Mm -hmm. yeah. Five years or so? Five years, yeah. And you, I mean, you left, you, or you started, you moved to London 10 years ago, ish, 11 yeah, years. Yeah, for, a, it was only about, well, it was, I was only there for about four months because I got fired, effectively. I wasn't, I wasn't going to bring it up. You, you, you mentioned it to me in confidence earlier and it isn't something that we got to dwell on. But I do think it's one of those things where sometimes getting fired can be a good thing. Yeah. And 10 years on, I still think I got fired for the right reasons. We haven't got to go into those reasons mm, now, but he no. told me them and he is correct. Um, how has... Well, I guess, like, when did the blog start as well? And, like, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd like to know, because, sure. like, the way that we looked at blogs 10 years ago is yeah. completely different to how we look at them now. Yeah. Like, how, how has that changed? 2008, I started a blog. I think that was. So I was at uni at the time, and we had to... I think we were tasked to write an article in some way or form, and I just thought, I'll do it as a blog. And I think, Holly, my wife, or I think it was, she, I said to her, well, maybe I could just do do blog and every, every now and again I'd do a weekly blog or something she was like yeah you're never going to keep it up though because I wasn't particularly good at keeping things like like sticking to stuff at the time and suddenly it snowballed and I just carried on and found this community that existed in blogging at the time um, and yeah it's evolved a lot I would say at, at this point I'm not really blogging as much but it's it this, it's all transferred to different platforms mm. So I try to, to, to um, treat certain um, posts on Instagram just as mini blogs, basically, rather than yeah, rather than spending time blogging maybe to no one. Yeah, it's like you can you can get like a proper like you've got your analytics there. Yeah. You've, you've cultivated you've cultivated this community, yeah. which is something which I think is so important about that. I mean, right at the start in blogging. I think menswear blogging as well would tend to be like quite like a small community. Everyone knew everyone, mm -hmm. and it feels like seventy five percent of them are also here. Probably, yeah, well, maybe, yeah, maybe a hundred percent. And I guess what what I want to say is like since then, do you feel like now that you've moved into having more lifestyle stuff, having more of you in there, and it being a bit more decentralized from a mm -hmm. blog to an Instagram, do you feel like that line between this is Matthew Spade and this is Matt Bucket's blurred into, into a one weird space? Interesting. So I've got two names there. Interesting. No, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. the duality of man, but I've just done that already. Yeah. Um, I mean, everyone's got a character. And I'd say that, I mean, just like on telly, um, people that play themselves but amp it up 100% like Larry David on Kirby Enthusiasm it's him just ramped up yeah isn't it which is the same as wrestling it's them they're the best characters ramped up yeah um, you don't relate to someone who doesn't make sense like Doink the Clown from the 90s a little a little guy that was a wrestler that was painted as a clown yeah Steve Austin he's the man get into that gobbledygooker not into it <laughs> The Undertaker, a seven foot well, tall undead different. man. Yes. Fine. Yeah. I get that. Obviously. Um, obviously. I think... Well, I'd say, I'd say the, um, I wouldn't say there's two different sides of me as such. All right. But when does the line start to blur between, so when you're talking about these conversations that you have with your wife and the stuff mm. that's happening in, in your house a lot, in your stories and you make that into content and mm -hmm. stuff, when does that start to go? I've got a line. Yeah, when, got, when, when, you, when, you, when you're like, maybe I'll just leave that one. Or when you're just sort of like, that's something nice. Maybe I should make that into content. Does yeah. that ever start to blur? Yeah. I mean, it's like, I'll, I'll share the odd food thing here and there on my story. And bit, bit off brand. That, but it's just part of my life and I really enjoy cooking and I cook every day pretty much. And it just feels right. And I think the, the people that follow me, maybe a big portion of them are just following me because of the overall what I'm sharing, food, DIY, clothes, travel, not really at the moment, uh, <laughs> fashion stuff. Yeah. It's probably because the people that are following me are a bit like me and that's what they're into. Mm. It's interesting what you say about moving into a more of a, a lifestyle space and it being, <clears throat> is it just me and people following me because it's like, Matt is sound or your life on occasion is just incredibly wholesome 
or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It just it just seems that way. When you're, yeah. I won't call it a patio okay. because you told me earlier, you're like, it's not just a patio, it's a front garden. <laughs> when you're doing stuff around the house, yeah, it seems just like you have this very natural way of telling stories that don't really feel like content. And but but really sort of like tread this is why I was interested in it because it feels like you tread this very delicate line between the two. Mm. So I, it was just it was just intriguing to me as a fellow content creator, being yeah. like, "How do you do that? Like, it must be like, when do you ever do you ever sit there and have a conversation with your wife and just be like, I'm gonna really document our front garden.' That's interesting." <laughs> <laughs> have you got any freeing stones out of it? Um, I tried. The company didn't get back to me. No? Uh, not a masonry no. influencer just no, yet? Not yet. Not yet. Gravel Master, uh, no, they failed. It'll come. It'll come. Um, You'll get some gravel in the, through the door. But it's, it's usually Holly. She'll, she'll be like, wouldn't that be good? Mm. Wouldn't people want to know that? Like, we just got some porcelain steps delivered, <clears throat> which we will be... Thank you. Fancy, straight from Italy. A lot of uh, porcelain step fans in the... Uh, yeah, place, big so. up. Um, but we're going to be... I'm going to be laying them myself, basically, mm. a step. So I'm just going to YouTube and we'll figure out with um, Holly's dad. We'll do it together, figure out how to lay a step. Now, there's probably not something that many people are going to be doing, but maybe someone sees it and be like, you can do that yourself, you know. Yeah. Save about 500 quid, do it yourself. Do you think like that's kind of like the next stage of where your career is at. Do you feel like yourself moving away from um, fashion probably being... Um, you mean a DIY show? A uh, reality show? Not a DIY show, but if anyone from whatever satellite DIY channel is satellite. watching... Satellite, yeah. Do they have satellite? Freeview? Yeah. It must be Freeview. Mm. Whatever, DIY TV. But do you feel like that's something that you're kind of moving away from now, being purely fashion to being like, this is... Yeah, I don't feel comfortable just talking about fashion. Why not? It's it's It feels... It's like there's too much focus on the way someone looks. I don't, I don't really feel that comfortable with that. Um, which is why I probably deflect certain things with narrative and maybe humour. Mm. So it's not all about what I'm wearing. It's maybe like what I'm doing while I'm wearing it or just how it looks. To, just more relatable, I suppose. Do you feel like really. that's why it's maybe resonated with people when you have dipped your toe into, say really expensive hoodies, which is something that's very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you feel like that's something that sort of like makes it resonate with people because you are coming at it from, as I said in the intro, my expertly delivered intro, that it's it was it's always been sort of like about accessibility, about yeah. sort of like this egalitarian way of approaching fashion or whatever, where it's not supposed to be. I mean, yeah, you've got to consider the fact that these things cost money and are often very expensive, yeah. but... Price, it's not, it's, it's, yeah. not, it's, not really, it's not really about you being, you looking a certain way or doing whatever. It's about sort of like comfort and quality and all that sort of stuff. Price of items is not lost on me. And coming from a, like one of the more working class towns in, in the UK, mm. I, I get it. And I get if it's like a hoodie's, uh, say, super expensive, like you say. I, you've got. I'm not sure if you can justify it in that in that sense. Like it's just an expensive hoodie, but I would would I turn down an expensive hoodie to wear it to to know what it feels like? Mm. No, I don't think I would. Um, but yeah, it's totally not lost on me. And I hopefully, you know, by wearing, I don't I don't know if I've ever worn an expensive hoodie. By the way, Is that, that's more you that I do. Oh, all right, you've called <laughs> you've called me out now immediately. I'm, I'm, talking, wear... I'm talking about brands like Canva and stuff yeah. like that, which are when I was to wear, it's, uh, a, it's a different price point to the upper echelon, but it's still for what people pay for hoodies. Yeah. expensive. Yeah, I had someone the other day say, "Oh, how much is how much was that hoodie?" And I think it was like eighty five quid. And then the guy said, oh, "I was looking for maybe more twenty five. It was just a different market, and I, I can still suggest maybe what's the best you could get for maybe you could spend like 15 quid more than 25 and get a pretty decent one yeah. that last year. So, yeah, it's not lost on me, and it, it obviously it's, it can be superficial, can't it? The pro, like, very, it's just clothes, isn't it? It's just trying to look it, good in stuff. It is, it is clothes, but I think that what clothes do is that they speak to so much more about 
I mean, I also come from a working class family and working class background and like spending money on expensive clothes. And mm -hmm. that sort of like says something to how you are feeling and how you are sort of like trying to project this version of mm -hmm. yourself. Blackpool is still a, a very working class area. I know that you said that that's something that weighs heavy on your mind. Or well, certainly something that you think about mm -hmm. quite often. Um, is that something that sort of like, when you are thinking about things, you're just like, fucking hell, I'm spending 300 quid on a jacket here. Um, no, because I've worked hard for it. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so um, at all, really. Mm. No, no. I mean, there's, there's worse things to spend a lot of money on, isn't there? I mean, I completely agree. And I think that the way that we've been talking about, and I know it's something that you've touched on before, but like with something like, a sweatshirt or whatever, and I know, and we'll talk about your quest for the perfect grey sweatshirt soon, because it's something that I'm fascinated by, obviously. <laughs> um, you're noticing a trend. And um, something like that is, there's a sustainability element as well, where I also think that there's an element of education, and I don't mean that in a, a way that sounds condescending, I just mean, if you tell someone, it's like, you can buy three, four, five hoodies over the space of like, five years or you can buy one really nice hoodie mm -hmm. and in the long run save mm -hmm. yourself some money and I think that there is <clears throat> you're kind of not taught that especially sort of like when I was growing up you're not like you're not really taught that sort of like difference between quality and sustainability it's just sort of like you only look at the price you don't really yeah. look at like what leads on yeah. from there do you think that that's something that's become well, I, more important to you the, the camber hoodie that you mentioned um that I purchased I got it second hand that was that was the first thing I bought it off my mate for 40 quid and it, and it feels amazing. Mm. It feels absolutely amazing. It feels like, I mean, it could be, if that was 300 quid, like, I'd be pretty happy with that. You'd be like, yeah, feel, fair enough. It feels amazing. It makes me feel amazing. Um, I think I th what I'm talking about in terms of sustainability, I think it's, do you think that you justify your background with the money that you spend on clothes by being like, well, buying things secondhand, and there is a, an element of education to being like, well, if we all didn't buy as much or as often yeah. and we sort of spent a little bit more on stuff and you can get more wear out of it, that's better for everyone involved. Whereas yeah. you only really see the top line, which is price tag. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a big comfort in wearing clothes over time and seeing them change with you and, and making them feel like yours. Yeah. Um, which I love, which is what I think the camber hood is going to be. So I must have... My price per wear on that was fantastic at the moment. And then that's like three times a week for the last, you know, six months or something. Hope Canberra are watching this. <laughs> it's just one person and the, the factory flooded uh, really? a couple of weeks ago. No orders for six months, unfortunately. Um, the price of our hoodies just went up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but actually that will probably create some form of demand when he gets back in the market, that guy. They'll be like blazing through sales. Um, has that answered your question? A little bit. Um, I think I think what you're saying there about the... I the say, educational side of it, things. There's the educational I mean, side. I, I learn a lot from my friends. Jordan, hello. Um, definitely. And it's a conversation to be to be had. And I, we, me and Jordan talk about it um, every now and again. And um, yeah, I think it's important. I, I think there's, there's a balance. For me, there's a balance because... <clears throat> sometimes when work comes my way and it, it doesn't fit, mm. then that's cool. It's just not right for me in terms, it might be the brand, it might be the messaging, whatnot. Uh, but then if a, if a brand does come my way and I like the brand, um, maybe the messaging is a, is a little off that they could work on, but ultimately I still need to pay my bills. Yeah. Then I've got to make the decision there. That's, and, it's, yeah. it, it's, it's hard welcome when... Welcome to freelance. Well, I mean, thank you for your belated welcome, but still a welcome. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think what's interesting that you, that you touch on there is just sort of like the reasonably precarious life of someone who, if not lives and dies, I don't want to make it that dramatic. But like mm -hmm. certainly um, you are, like your reputation is mm -hmm. sacrosanct really. And if you're and you're you're a couple of bad recommendations away yeah. from people being like, who's this guy? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's something I think about. Um, I spoke about that last week at the chat.
experience I was speaking to. Like, it's important. People remember. Mm. People remember stuff. Um, a, a, a simple one is a guy like me and do a whiskey project. The month later, he's doing another whiskey project. And the month later, he's got another one going out. So I was, you know, which one's the best? Like, which, what can we trust? Yeah. And suddenly, we can't trust that guy. Is that something that you didn't really take that into account when you first sort of like started dipping your toe into this sort of world? Or, or was it something you always kind of had a, an innate feeling of, I need to be careful of like what I sort of like pitch my flag to? It, it took time. It definitely took time. And everyone's made mistakes. And I've definitely made mistakes. Like, there's a few things that I wish maybe I hadn't done or, over, but maybe in, in hindsight, yeah, I've just grown up mm. and they're not the kind of brands that I would shop at anymore. Um, but it's something I think about a lot. Integrity. It's a massive, massive deal for me. Speaking of integrity. Are we talking about sweatshirts? No, we're going to talk about Seinfeld now. Oh. Um, Seinfeld being something <clears throat> that you feel quite passionately about. <clears throat> and then my own feelings about it, I will set aside mm -hmm. until later in about three questions time in which I will bring them back okay. up again. Why do you think it's endured as a cultural reference for people? Because it's something which seems like it... I mean, you were talking about baggy trousers or big trousers there, when mm. you, like your first ever article, which is very, very much in now. You could, you could dig that article out now. Mm. and just punt that around. And you'd, you'd get someone to buy that pretty Spelling quickly. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe run it through spell check mm. real quickly. <laughs> Why do you feel like Seinfeld is something that has lasted uh, stylistically? Mm. We'll get into the writing and stuff in, in a bit, if you like, but... Stylistically, by me, I think it's probably just in terms of the style, because I did see that it popped up on Lists app when it went over to um, Netflix, actually. Oh, yeah. I think it's probably the, the the whole 90s thing and like young people being interested in the 90s because that seems old now. Mm. So when I was younger, I was interested in 80s stuff and 70s stuff. So I guess that, I guess it maybe it's that. It's like the stylized 90s mm. aesthetic. Maybe it's that. There's kind of like, there's a comfort to the way that they wear those clothes as well, yeah. which, where it feels like... <clears throat> Obviously, if if you're wearing that now and you're dressed like George Costanza now, there's a bit loser, there's total an, loser. There's an, I mean, he looks fucking cool. Let's let's get it right. <laughs> but like, there's an element of costume to it where yeah. there is a more natural way of how they were dressing, perhaps apart from puffy shirts and whatever else, massive yeah. jackets. I reckon Crane is probably the exception in a way, but. He was just dressing, he was just going to vintage shops, wasn't he? Mm. So it's just the equivalent of, you know, he, he likes his 50s shirts. That's it. And how big were they, like, last year? We've all That's been some, through that phase. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You, um, you ever had a bad phase like that? Clothing? Yeah. Big Hawaiian yeah. shirt face? I wouldn't say that's bad. Each their own. I've got it's a lot. Not, it's not for me. Look, if you've got Hawaiian shirts, I didn't mean to... Yeah. Public, so, on so public subject. records, I've yeah. got some. I've got some flowery shirts and stuff. But um, I'd say, Not for me to judge. I, I when well, when I first met, met Holly, which was probably about two thousand and six. That was before skinny jeans happened, <laughs> so everyone was in either skater baggy jeans or flares at that point, which is weird to think about. Yeah. So a twenty-year-old was flares. Basically, I went to Manchester. And I saw these guys at Pop Boutique wearing skinny jeans. And so I didn't know what was going on. And then I thought, right, how do I get a pair of them? And nowhere sold them at the time. So I thought, I've got a sewing machine. Let's do it. And I did them so tight, they had no stretch in them. And Holly had to tie my shoelaces. <laughs> so I'd say that's a mistake. Standing around town, getting my new girlfriend to tie my laces. <laughs> Awful. And it was pink stitching as well. It's a choice, isn't it? Yeah. Do you still have those jeans? No. No? No, no, I don't. That's cut them off you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then I was doing that every week. I went to fashion college and then, because I, I learned to sew there, I was just taking in all my jeans. And then suddenly they're in shops like six months later. And that was the thing. See, it's interesting because I think that's that. So when I, I think we're a reasonably similar age. Mm -hmm. 
when I started seeing lads wearing really skinny jeans, I was like, where do I get these? And everyone yeah. was just like, have you tried the women's section of any shop? And yeah. I was like, okay, I can do that. Top shop. H&M. Other shops are available, obviously. And I was just like, oh, okay, cool. I could just go and that buy them. The, the, the fact that your brain immediately went to, oh, I feel like I can make this myself, yeah. s- strikes me as someone who has a different understanding of fashion and sort of like forging what they actually like about fashion. Yeah, that, would, that was definitely not a, a conscious thing. I just thought, probably do that. I just, uh, you know, I've got a sewing machine. My sister did textiles. Mm. I could probably have a go at that. And it worked. Should see the pictures though. Still got them. I can fucking imagine, Jesus Christ. I had an afro at the time as well. <laughs> that's long gone. It's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a lot to take in, Matt. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Um, yeah. it's, have you seen Larry David's old hair? I have, yeah. It was that. Terrible. A power donut, it turned into, just at the back. A power donut? Yeah. That's why you shave it off. I can't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, quite, it's quite hard to argue with that choice. Uh, if you can send them that picture, they can just edit it in yes. and post. Yes. This is the power donut. Um, so you said that your sister studied textiles. Yeah. Um, what did uh, your parents, Mr. and Mrs. Bucket, what did they um, What did they do? Like, did you get uh, like style inspiration from them? Was that something that was home, like in your house? Home life, uh, single mum of three. Uh, and then we lived with my grandparents. Uh, my grand, my granddad was a footballer and then retired and became a welder and my nan was a hair model which is pretty fancy that's really fancy yeah which doesn't sound working class but it it i don't know how i don't know where that comes from but that's yeah. what she, the picture of her in the 50s or 60s with a blackpool tower in a, a as her hair <laughs> <laughs> hair model was there, um, was, there so any, was there any reason for that? Or did you just, that's just what, no, they, that that's, that's that what they give you if you don't give a, specific instructions in a hair salon in Blackpool? That was a job. <laughs> that was a job. That was a job. She was a hair model. Someone's got to do it. Um, <laughs> n- uh, no, no, no fashion background at all. I, I'm, I was always interested in old pictures and mm. the way my family looked. They all looked so smart, even though they were doing nothing, particularly going to the beach. My granddad's got a shirt and tie on with his trousers rolled up at the beach. To me, that that always said something to me. Yeah. When I saw old pictures. Um, it still does now, and it, it has done all the way through my life. Which is why I'm so. I'm, when people ask where do you get style inspiration from, <clears throat> it's usually television and film. Uh, watching old films or things in Seinfeld was a good example, um, and just seeing how it was styled at the time. What I find interesting is um, when something's of, of a period when it's been styled retrospectively and mm. it doesn't look right you can tell straight away it's like something's off they've got skinny jeans on but they're on the, in the wrong decade and you can tell and i'm interested in stuff like that mm. fascinated when you said that you were um enamored with sort of like looking at these old photos <clears throat> of what what do you think that really evoked like were you just sort of like there's the element of i've seen how my family dress at the beach not quite as cool as that but also yeah. sort of like there is a real it's the pride i think and it's the smart turnout making an effort mm. um but then you'll see you'll see like someone on holiday and they've, they've really gone for it with the shirts and the stuff um and just having fun with it yeah. or, or you might watch like I don't know, there's, a, there's an Elvis documentary on Netflix. We, we watched it a few weeks ago. Um, he picked out all his own wardrobe. He did all his own styling and stuff. And he's, he, he looks awesome. And he was a superstar. And yeah, just see to see how someone says something so much by clothing. Yeah, mm. It's cool. Just, just fascinated by it. You've absolutely set me up for this. What are you trying to say for your clothing and for your um, sort of sense of style? Uh, comfort. I would say probably comfort. Um, blimey, that's a good question. I don't have a clue. I'm a professional journalist. I don't have a clue about that. <laughs> what am I trying to say? Um, right, right. Well, what, we'll, what we'll do is we'll break down each each part of it. So it's comfort, a fit check. So comfort, yeah, we'll do a fit check. All right, okay. No, but, no, but like, no, what we'll do is, so like when you said about comfort, yeah. 
Why is comfort something that's important to you? Where does that, where does that come from? Well, skinny jeans were good and they looked at the time, they, you know, they looked appropriate, but eventually you figure out oh, that's not comfy. Mm. None of that. Tight, tight stuff. And, and I wouldn't say I've got a, a body that I want to show off as such. <laughs> so anything that's clinging, I'm, I'm very aware of. So it's out. So mm. comfort, um, I'm coming down to London, so I'm traveling three and a half hours on the train. I'm wearing the same outfit all day long because I don't get to get changed today. So I want to be comfy, but I still want to feel like me. So as soon as I put something on that is a color that I wouldn't normally wear or a fit of trousers that feels a bit off. Just don't feel like me. It's not right. I wouldn't feel right all day. It's a bit like, um, I don't know, like not shaving when you think you should have shaved and you've gone out, you just don't feel like you. Yeah, it's yeah. like, oh, something's not right. I've missed something. Yeah. yeah, something small. That's it, really. How does yeah. that, so when it's such an innate sense of style, how does that then feel when people, whether you know them or don't know them, that you're like, they're like, can you give me any tips? Can you, can you, can you? What, in real life? Yeah, I mean, that must, that must happen. I, I mean, even I <laughs> have people do that to me and I'm far less cool than you are. You are like, essentially at this point, Please. you are like, no, no I'm you not sure. I, I am pretty cool. But like, yeah. at, the, at this point, you are essentially a professional tastemaker. And as, as, as much as it pains me to say it, you kind of are. That is why we're here. Okay. <laughs> but like, it's like, if, if people, go, so when it's such an innate sense of style to you and you're just sort of like going, I just want to sort of like do what feels comfortable to yeah. me. Then when it comes down to it, right, break that down. Yeah. How do you then well, inter uh, intellectualise yeah, that? Yeah, I love, I love chatting about it. I love chatting about clothes. I always mm. have done. Um, I, I'm pretty good at suggesting alternatives because the price factor that is that is an issue um but and I'm, I'm i would say i'm pretty aware of brands and what the brands are doing and new brands and old brands um i quite just like to take an interest in what's going on so i think i've always i've probably always got a conversation or likewise i've got someone to recommend that knows more about something that i don't know about mm. always someone on hand to pass the conversation over to um I just think it's a cool subject, you know. It is. A, it, it. It's one of those that sort of encompasses so much as well. Is because it's not just about the actual items of clothing that you're wearing. It's the traditions and the cultures that have gone into that, <clears> and <throat> the stories behind the brands, and all of these other elements as well. So it's like if you're interested in history or geography or. <clears throat> sociology or whatever, like these are all stories that could be told through clothing. As much as we want to just break it down to, I feel comfortable. Yeah. Here is some big trousers. Yeah. They help me feel nice on the train. Well, they are they are, uh, they are water big. repellent. Are they? And yeah, they're made by a Scottish brand, Kesson. Um, the colour is taken from the local area. Hmm. So it makes sense to them. I'd say this is a wider fit than they, they normally would do because their client likes it a little bit slimmer. Um, but yeah, I mean, it does. It's it isn't it nice to know about why a certain thing is. Mm. Like for instance, I've got this cuff, which is it's got a split hem at the side here, which I'm, it's you don't really see that much on. Shirts. That is an interesting cuff, and I get to say that so rarely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, I think there's a few brands that do it, but I, I, I would like to know why it is. So I'm going to look at that. But I assume it's. It'll be a practical thing, I imagine. Yeah. So your your arm will split for a reason doing that, unless it's taken from, it's a Japanese brand, mm -hmm. the jacket, unless it's a traditional Japanese thing that's been lessened into a fashion item. Could mm. be that. It's interesting, isn't it? It is interesting. I really thought you were going to hit me with the reason, and now I I, I won't no. be thinking about anything else apart from that. Not this time. Well, I was I was listening to um, a chat by our excuse me, a, a friend the other day was talking about uh, mod culture. Mm. And was talking about why they adorn their bikes with so many mirrors. And there's a particular reason why they do that. And isn't that nice for someone to know that? Yeah. And the reason why is that is because it was, uh, there was no rules on how many lights you could, uh, how many mirrors you could have on the bike. And then suddenly the, um, the safety police, 
Gashima <laughs> Safety Police yeah. said, you're going to need one or more lights on that bike. So they just went, screw it, and put loads on and just went crazy with it. And that's why there's loads. And so you see those, those mod pictures and all the guys in the Italian suits just, wear, and just on these bikes. Yeah. And that's the reason. And it's the same for clothes. Like there's, there's a reason why specific things are doing there. And if there's not, like, what the heck's it doing? It's one really. of those things where you'll buy something, especially if it's a bit of a higher price point, and they'll be like, give you some spiel about it's cut like this or it's got this sort of hem yeah. or whatever. And you're like, eh, I mean, it's just... Does it like, fit? Yeah, it feels <laughs> like you're just like padding out your SEO here. <laughs> but when you try it and you find the thing that fits for like your body type or like the, even the way you move and stuff like that, mm -hmm. if it's got like a higher arm hole and a shirt and stuff like that, yeah. you're like, oh, okay, that's... That's why. And then when you go away from that, you're like, it's so fascinating the way that you can have lived your entire life without having like, oh, I should have a shirt of a higher armhole. And now you're like, look how low that armhole is. Yeah. That's just, I hate that shirt. <laughs> and you end up throwing away all this stuff. I think it's so interesting how you can, I think that's one of the things that like, I think I, I, I see it a lot in menswear, but fashion in general, where you just have something that comes out that everyone's like, whoa, mad, I hate that. And then it just becomes ubiquitous immediately because they're like, okay, cool, this is what you can do with that. And I think that that's how we went from the abhorrent boot cuts and flares and stuff to skinny jeans where people are just like, you can wear like lower profile shoes and you can wear vans and you can wear yeah. converses and stuff like that with them and they don't look mad. Yeah. And then from that, you go back and you go big and wide again and it becomes yeah. one of those things where now it seems impossible to even think about going back to that skinny jean phase. Yeah. I'm it's, possibly a bit old for that now as well. I don't know. Although you do see guys down the... See, the guys down the pub, specific pubs though, maybe up north. Uh, you get them. They've still got... They've got the skinny jeans on, but they've still got the shoes that they wore with the boot cut trousers, which doesn't look good. <laughs> do you ever just tap them on the shoulder like, all right, mate? No, I, I, I rarely, I've got go, a shoe I rarely brand for go to a pub. <laughs> you I, don't? Don't, I don't fit in. No? No. Why not? You don't like football. Yeah, that's but that's a big so, bit of it. Sometimes I love the rugby on. Although my granddad was an ex-footballer. You can just so say that. You can just say that. I was I was mad in football up until about 15 when I realised Spurs were crap <laughs> at the time. And then, and then suddenly my granddad... Thank passed. God you like realised in time. Yeah, it, we, we, they were getting like seventh in the league every year and then my granddad passed away. Sadly, he was a massive Spurs fan and suddenly they got good. There you go. That's what he would have wanted. But yeah, I'm not much of a pub guy. It's interesting so. what you say about football because it's it's something, it was for me, and I know that it has been for like a lot of men as well. It can be a real gateway to opening up um, different subcultures when it comes to men's fashion especially, mm -hmm. and it has this whole storied history of that. Um so it's interesting that it's something that is sort of like you kind of like dipped your toe into and then moved away yeah, from I'm, immediately. I was a and, massive fan. and especially in the north as well and, and in the, the northwest. <clears throat> it's a bit if you're into menswear, yeah. people assume that you are that you are at least have an affinity with casual culture and football and yeah. going the match and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. How was it when you sort of like you had you were like, yeah, I'm into fashion, but also not this side of it? It, at first, I, I get what you mean. It's it was like, we, especially when I was younger, it was like well, this guy kind of doesn't look right. Yeah, and there's, I, I went to art college, and I think it was just part of that, really. But I think um, I've never had an issue. A bit like the accent thing, maybe not in the same, specifically the same way, but it's a confidence thing. I've never really thought, oh, uh, I shouldn't be wearing this in a certain place because that's not what they wear down there, or yeah. Um, and I think that maybe comes from a, just having fun with it. And I think when we went into the first lockdown as well, I started realising that I was uh, more, dressing more relaxed for comfort. And then that's continued. Maybe things have got wider. Maybe, maybe sweatshirts have got softer. Um, yeah, so I, I, I've never had an issue with that, really. It's interesting yeah. when, you, when you talk about lockdown, I think everyone's invested in some uh, nice sweatpants or whatever. Because what else are you going to do? Can't, mm. can't go to the pub. Mm -hmm. um, 
Do you think that there is so one? I know that you said that you've you've sort of like felt things relax a lot more. Do you think that there'll also be a resurgence of the other side yeah. of that as well? I think people are like. To. I think there will be. I've not. I've, do, you, do, you, do you see you dressing up a bit more? I mean, like your style is very sort of like casual and quite like soft. Yeah. And even if it's something that even approaches, I mean, like even your jacket there, it's all quite soft shoulders and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Can you see yourself sort of being like, I'm going out tonight? Even if you're just oh. sort of like, even even if you're not going out, you're just like, I just want to dress up tonight. Yeah, I'm I'm not very good at it. I think my I can do casual very well, which is why I was like conscious of not having any kind of dress code tonight. Just because I don't want to be dressing smart, particularly, I need to be all or nothing. Yeah. So if I'm dressing smart, I need to wear a suit because it's pretty much the only thing I can handle all in one go. Yeah, I can't do like the bits and bobs. It it doesn't really look that good on me. Um, Last week I went to Manchester with Jordan and I felt like I looked quite smart from what I was wearing. And I said, you know, I think this is probably the smartest I've been in a while. And he was like, no, no chance. Have you seen the jacket? Shabby or something. <laughs> Worn in shoulders and all this stuff. And you thought, I you thought, thought like, you had this sort of like Florence, like soft tailoring I style like going. Pretty loose wool trousers, which were, you know, like pleats. To me, that's like tick, smart. Yeah. Um, a lambswool jumper. I felt smart, <laughs> personally. As long as you feel smart. Sorry, yeah. no offence to Jordan, but like... Mm, but it was my smart. And I, yeah. I, I think when, when I got married, I wore a suit and I felt great in a, um, at the time. It doesn't fit anymore. It's too skinny. Mm. Things have moved on. But I think there will be a, a reaction at some point. I think it always happens. Everyone wants to do the opposite eventually. Uh, from skinny jeans to getting wider over time. Um, and then it, eventually, at some point, it's not going to be cool to be wearing loose stuff. It happens in every decade, you can see it. It's fascinating. What's going to happen to your entire wardrobe? Well, hopefully I'll go past the point where it doesn't really <laughs> matter anymore. Maybe, yeah. and I can settle into the George Costanza style. Fine, yeah. Or you'd be like one of those sort of like Nigel Cable types where they just sort of like, they just pretend that they live in the 1930s all the time. I wouldn't do that, but Larry <laughs> David's doing it pretty well. Yeah, and he, he seems like he's doing it well. The king of casual. You spoke about lockdown there and you, and you touched on the fact that travel is not even a thing for most of us all of the time. You've done a fair bit of that. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like when you go away for work or pleasure, um, is it is it something where you are sort of like going with half an eye on what's the style like in, in mind? I know that you mentioned Japan and you mentioned like your Japanese yeah. um, jacket there. When I went to Japan, I was just struck by the average level of style there where things didn't, felt considered, but in a way that was so casual and so comfortable. The way they people. wear it and it was yeah. it's normal to wear certain things and I was... Uh, I remember when I was in Japan, I was struck by how much navy there was. Indigo absolutely everywhere, from the old guys on the street to the the police to just just regular Joes, like every generation wearing this very similar fabric. Mm. It's fascinating. Um, but then when I've been on holiday in Florida, which is definitely not known for its fashion, like to not, see what not the, really no, no, but to see what the old guys are wearing, like just on their, their holiday game, it's not particularly like, it's very other style, but they love it. Yeah, they and dress like they go to CSM. What's that? Central St. Martins. You really aren't from London, are you? <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> so I say that again, they dress like they go to art college in central London. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you're making me feel like I'm out of place. Uh, <laughs> how do we turn this round? I'd so, like to say I did, Seinfeld I did, again. I did fashion at university, I'll have you know. I know you did, and I didn't, to be fair. Yeah. So you've, you've but, got one up on me there. But the Florida thing is a good example. It's like just old guys that are retired, but it's a certain way they, they wear certain things like that you probably wouldn't see anywhere else. And it's very identifiable. Yeah. It's like if you went to, I don't know, say, Portland, uh, up in Washington, uh, It'd be the same as that. It'd be like the old the old guys wearing the logging gear and stuff, and wearing a very specific way for practical reasons. Just look cool, look cool doing it. I think it comes back to like what you were saying there about if you feel comfortable, you feel comfortable, no matter what it is. And 
I've known people that have gone through weird phases of wearing secondhand suits every day and or wearing skinny jeans and dressing all in black or wearing ridiculously wide Japanese stuff that they've all bought from Dover Street Market and whatever phase that you go through. But if that's like what you're feeling at that point, I feel like it's something which should be encouraged. And I feel like there's, it sounds rote to say it, but like there is a freedom of expression through your clothing. Mm. I think that proper, like a lot of people weren't really exposed to very early on. I certainly was. And it wasn't until I moved out and started having a little bit of money of my own that I was like, I'm getting a big coat. Yeah. <laughs> no one can tell me what coat I'm going to buy. I'm going to buy the biggest, maddest coat I can find. What did you get? I bought this, and I, I, I bought this coat from Blue Blue Japan that was a big, it was, oh, it sounds shit now, but it was like this big indigo, <clears throat> like woven cotton coat that was like, I want to say like two third length, okay. but it just stained everything I had, really dark blue. My yeah. hands, neck, cl- like shirts, my, my desk in work. And it was like, it was the most expensive thing I'd ever bought. And I was so proud of it. I was like, I have made it. I have a big Japanese coat and it fucking ruined my life. <laughs> it was just shit. It was just like people were taking the piss out of me and work and stuff. But I was like, I still just felt fucking great. I couldn't, happened, wear it in, I couldn't wear it in the rain because it would just bleed navy. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever but, happened to it? Sent me mum's. Right. I've got I've got it and I'm, like there'll be there'll be one point in time where I'm just going to be like I am have, I've have self actualized to the point where I feel like I'm worthy of this blue mm. blue Japan life runa. But I feel like there is especially for men who haven't really been encouraged to express themselves through fashion. Most men, I know that like there are obviously exceptions to that. I feel like it's something where people can sort of like really branch out into realizing a personal style, which I think can be sort of like really eye-opening, not just in fashion, not just in menswear, but just sort of other areas of their life as well. I know that design is a big thing for mm. you as well and something that you feel very passionate about and you have your own sort of design sense. Mm. It feels like that leads quite naturally on from your sense of fashion as well. And I'm sure that it opens a lot of people up like that. I think it's... I think fa- I think fashion has that ability to do that, which I think probably people don't take um, or probably take a bit too for granted, I mm. think, sometimes. I think in terms of design, and I just, as you mentioned, is myself and Holly, my wife, we've got very different tastes. Like, she's very into old Hollywood stuff and uh, very over-the-top 1930s-looking uh, designs and stuff. But we both have an interest in mid-century culture and design. And it just sort of splices together, really. But then from her job, she's very into graphic design, which is how I got in. I started taking interest in that mm. kind of area and reading certain blogs and websites. Like, it's nice, that, and Creative Boom. And we've kind of just filled our house with stuff which makes us smile, really. Um, and that's that's that comes from, yeah, that's... That's our design. That's the way we look at it, really. Mm. Yeah. I think that's such a nice way of, of thinking about it. Just coming into a room and you'd be like, this has just made me happy. This has made me smile. Even yeah, like, stick a book on the coffee table. That makes us just think, oh, I've not seen that for ages. That's fun, that. I mean, you're, yeah. you're a man who appreciates a Japanese magazine and unless you've been absolutely chaining... I do, not very readable. Yeah, I was going to say, unless you've been chaining Duolingo, yeah. I'm not sure that you're going to really be getting a lot out of it. But Popeye on the table and you're a bit like... Yeah, that makes I, me well, feel happy that I was that's in, there. I was in Berlin and a, a lady from a, a fashion magazine over in Japan stopped me to take a picture to be in their magazine. And then I got a copy. I'm in like a, a Japanese fashion magazine. Just like my you've body com- cut out. You've, yeah, you've completed the circle. I love the way they cut out all their I'm the body cut well. out. To finish it off, and I'm going to make sure I read these so I actually get the questions correct. Uh, so this section is called Your Fashion Love Life. Right, okay. You're really glad the word fashion is in there, I can imagine, but we'll give it a go. <laughs> first crush. Can you remember the first piece of clothing that you really fell in love with? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, five years old, I had a Ready Breck sweatshirt that um, well, I couldn't, well, obviously my mum bought it for me. <laughs> Who else is going to buy it? Um, and uh, it looked ace now. It was just like heather grey massive red writing ready breck it was like everyone wakes up with a something or a, I don't know what it said but it was, I've got a picture of it with me and my granddad which is only one one of the only pictures I've got of me and my granddad and I do look like him now yeah 
Yeah, I'm getting there. Totally. So that's probably the first one. It's pretty young. It's a pretty good one, that is, to be fair. Um, this one's called Holiday Romance. Okay. Um, is there anything you've worn and possibly got carried away with a local style and then regretted that you've worn that once you've come back? I, uh, I bought a sombrero in, <laughs> in Spain and I was the person who wore it back on the plane when I was 15. 15 yes. is about your cut off, isn't it? To be fair. Any, uh, anything over 15 is culturally insensitive. 15 is just like, they're 15, fucking ignore them. I mean, I did, I, did <laughs> buy, I did buy it there. I didn't take it there. No, I, I know that. I mean, I'm talking about coming back. I'm talking, I'm talking about like people like seeing you coming back with it on. It, yeah, see, it looks stupid. <laughs> yeah? Did, yes. you, did you keep it? Have you got it, have you got it in a loft somewhere? Um, my mum is a, is like, my mum is pretty big at hoarding, so I imagine she's probably using it like, something in it. <laughs> Brilliant. Like a, holding some plants. Yeah, maybe. It'd be great. Get some aloe vera in there. Maybe. Um, the one that got away, this is something that pains me. Um, is there anything that you really wanted but missed out on because it's all sold out? That could be recent or mm. a grail item from a younger Matt. Um, I, I'd say no. I'd, I'm quite good at um, disconnecting from stuff. If I don't get something then I can I can move on quite quickly. Probably find something similar um down the line. I'll just wait it out. So I, w I wouldn't say there is. That's actually. interesting. That's very zen. <laughs> yes. I'll just wait it out, yeah. Would do. Do you how, like sidebar? Yeah. Do you feel do you feel like there is how how do you feel about that whole shift towards a reseller market and there being this mad scramble for Literally anything yeah. that is of value. How how does that? Make well, it's, you I feel? mean, it's not fair, is it? No, it's not fair. It doesn't give everyone a, a level playing field, um, and it's and it it, it promotes uh, even more hype culture and spending even more money on something that I'm probably not going to wear in a few years. Mm. Um, I think it speaks to like the accessibility element of what you were saying as well. It's like if that's not accessible on like the first drop. And then the only way that you can buy it is if you buy it off of an app for eight hundred dollars after. That's not like, right because that's... some kid that has got a bit too much money or parents have, he'll 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 get that and spend it, and then that could have a negative effect on is is the way he lives his life. Really, like from mm. then on, just think, right? I'll just pay for it. I can get anything. So that's not good. I wouldn't say. I don't like it either. Um, right, this one is object of desire. What is something that you are like currently, you've got it in your mind, you want it, maybe you haven't got the readies for it right now. It's something that you have got, um, it's, it's, it's in your eye line. You're saving up for it. Or the you're readies. Just sort of like, you're, just, you're, just, you're, you're building up the courage to take the plunge. Uh, if it's another sombrero, you can just give me some sort of... I would say, I would say and it's not something that I'm building up the courage for, it's something I haven't found yet. Mm. And that's the perfect grey sweatshirt. I'm glad we got to it. <laughs> but... The reason why is because it doesn't exist. Because I'd have to, I'd have to make it for it to be perfect to me. Yeah, I, I think so. I'm looking for a very good grey sweatshirt, basically. <laughs> That's fair. What so secondary sidebar? Yeah. What so like? What's what makes the perfect sweatshirt for you? I've got an old uh, menswear showroom in Comic Garden years ago. Original details of sweatshirts. Um, American sportswear, basically. With the V insert, some have the V insert on the back, raglan shoulders, shorter in the body, uh, big cuffs, wideish, but not baggy. Um, it's kind of, I can't find what I'm looking for. Just part, I mean, I know you said that this perfect ideal doesn't exist. It's because no, no body shape is, is the same. But, Oh, we've got an idea. Yeah, me and, turn off the cameras. Me and you are going to go into the, perf the perfect grey sweatshirt company. No, it's, is there part of the fun of that, knowing that you'll never quite find it? Because if you found it, you'll be like, what am I going to talk about? Yeah, oh, that's 60% of my content. I'm, I'm back to front garden stuff. I'm, I must admit. The patio stuff, sorry. Patio, it's not a patio. <laughs> I, must have, I must admit, um, as you all know, you, we're not the only Great sweatshirt enthusiasts. Sorry, 
people are Probably. very interested in this subject. I found it, yeah, what, like, what's going on? Mm. And I haven't, like I said, I'm probably not going to. But yeah, I think there is. I think there's there's lots of, and you can tell the people that aren't taking notice because they'll suggest things that you weren't looking for in the first place. Like, what about this one? I said I wanted a V, not a V. It's not got one. Um, so I just like the conversation that comes with it. And people, people are very outspoken with their favorite gray sweatshirt. And it's very personal. Just like anything is like jeans. Who's had a pair of jeans that actually fits right? Like really? And you have, you've got them vintage Levi's that I'm furious at whenever you wear them. Because when I asked you about them, like where can I buy them? You're like, oh, that's, <laughs> that's vintage, mate. I was like, fuck, <laughs> fuck off, yeah. Matt. Um, last one. This is lifelong love. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, what's an item that you have that you'll never, ever sell? Oof. Blimey. I would, the obvious answer that pops into my head would be my wedding suit, but it doesn't fit, so I may as well just get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> really. Holly, if you're watching, sorry. <laughs> no, someone could be wearing a, a really good suit out there. I could just get rid of it, right? Holly, if, I, if you're watching... He's got um, a point. What would I never get, never get rid of? I mean, there's a... I'm trying to fit a baseball caps. There's quite, I've got a few baseball caps that I've had for since I was a teenager that whip out every now and again. Mm. Um, I'd feel sad getting rid of them because they have a, a memory connected to them. A sentimental value. Yeah, definitely. A bit like the wedding suit. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't fit, right? No, and for now... Head's still the same size. Hey, it is skinny, so it might come back in. <laughs> um, yeah, probably old baseball caps that I've got pictures of me wearing when I was a teenager still. I'd say so. Vintage now. Get a few quid for that, mate, yeah. if you have if ever, uh, the, the gravel influencer stuff doesn't work out. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, after that bad joke. That's it, done. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching slash listening. And, yeah, we can all go back to having a beer now. Thank you very much. Everyone has to clap. Thank you to Matt.